Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the start of summer. Summer. I pray, Father, that we can be pleasing to you in following your son and being an ambassador for him on this earth, um, and that we can not just look at your word, but we can put it into practice. And uh, be with me this morning as I as I preach, and uh, help me to speak fearlessly as your son would do. To Jesus, name we pray. Amen. So good morning, y'all go online. Those of you who are tuning in, we would love to have you in person. I think summer, we're gonna help you out, of course, with having some open uh, outdoor services, if that's, uh, if that's gonna help you easy win. But uh, otherwise, you know, we'd love, to, we'd love to have you join us too, just to encourage you there. Um, Sam asked me this morning if I would preach on Ephesians 6. And uh, we've had a great series, I think, if you've, if you've been uh, with us for the past uh, month, two months or so. Um, the great speaker, from Ryan to Sam to um, to Kevin Finnerty to Paris to everyone else that kind of spoke on the on the book of Ephesians. It's one of the best and, and most amazing books in talking about family and grace and redemption. And it is, in fact, the scriptures in kind of a microcosm in the book itself. Um, and so thank you also for the opportunity to close us out and preach on Ephesians 6. We're going to start in Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10. And I think if this clicker works... Great. Uh, we're going to start in Ephesians 6, verse 10. But before I go there, in the first nine verses, which we're not going to read, Paul addresses children, parents, servants, and masters. And at the risk of sounding obvious, uh, addressing the children in this paragraph, as well as their parents, conveys the expectation that whole families were to come together for public worship. So welcome, especially to all the teens and preteens on the left-hand side. And the children throughout your faith, I certainly didn't have your faith and your convictions when I was your age. And I think a lot of us in this room would say the same thing. So I'm impressed. And I think your future is bright and amazing because of how seriously you're taking God's word and trying to follow Jesus now at a young age. So that's pretty amazing. Um, uh... Also with that, we've had the children in the service for a while and we're gonna try, and I say try, but I think it's gonna be to his glory. We're gonna launch the church children's ministry again next weekend. And so that's gonna be an amazing thing. I wanted to thank all the teachers and all of the volunteers, frankly, the, the, the security, because that's not a small feat to put that on and it doesn't happen without our volunteers. So look forward to that. Really quickly about children. So the call is to obey, right? And obey, when we think of that word, we don't really like that word as Americans. We wanna be independent, right? We don't like following what someone else says. It's written, of course, in, the, in maybe of three, three different kind of contexts. Nature, which is just, it's self-evident that we obey parents, because as a child, where are we going to get direction? It's not just the scriptures, right, where we follow our parents. It, it ends up being in all societies, if you look at the world. The law, which goes back to the Ten Commandments, it's, it's, it's in, in fact in Exodus 20.12 and Deuteronomy 5.16 that this may go well with you. And so we honor our, our parents. We honor God by holding and obeying to his teachings. And then the last one, the, the gospel, obey the parents. Obey, we obey parents in the Lord. Children, we obey be parents in the Lord because it's a responsibility to, to in, in, in response to love. And while not all parents are loving, we certainly have a loving God and a loving father. And so no matter what your home life is like, we can obey our parents, assuming they're not breaking God's love, because it's a response to love. And so I'll just say that quick snippet for, for the children from the first uh, nine verses. I think on parents, the amazing thing about Paul's challenge to parents is that he paints a picture that is self-controlled, that is gentle and and that fathers and mothers may be patient educators of their children and i think this was in a very sharp contrast to the roman world where the father ruled the roost the father could make their children sell them into slavery and not break the law in that culture so this was pretty radical not only in the setting of rome but i think even today right where where, where parents if it's truly going to be like like jesus in loving our children that, that, that picture of what God would do on earth in raising children and fostering those kind, uh, that kind of household, you can only imagine what that produces and, al and in allowing children to blossom and develop their gifts. 
So I think us, we have this gift, obviously in the scriptures, to be able to follow Jesus and to, and to lead with love and to end up nourishing and, and feeding our, ch our children as parents in this way. If I was to have a show of hands, how many men or women, parents in the, in the audience, have slipped up in this way? And I think a lot of us go, indeed, hands go up. But we return, the difference maybe with us is we return to the standard and that we can be judged by our reach in trying to be like Jesus so that we can catch ourselves and repent and, and change as parents. No parent is perfect, but, I, but if we're trying to be like Jesus and we have people to help hold us accountable, I think that there's a difference. There should be a difference in a Christian household versus the world, whether it's a Roman world or our current world. It should be a stark contrast. And this scripture in, in the first nine verses, it was centuries before modern psychology emphasized the vital importance of the earliest years of life, that children are fragile creatures needing the tenderness and security of love in order to be able to become who they can be, who God created them to be. And maybe the last thing I'll say about parents is the best thing we can do as parents is to be spiritually strong. If you've ever kind of heard the analogy of, a, of, a, of an airplane, you know, that asks you to put on your oxygen masks, it's the parents first, it's the adult first, and then you put the oxygen mask to your children. If we, if we aren't spiritually healthy, we won't have anything to give to our children. And so if, we're, if you're a parent in the audience, if you're a parent listening, the best thing you can do is to focus on, on what you're doing and in, in your leadership shadow, your parenting shadow in reflecting Jesus. There's a book uh, written by John Louis called Good Enough Parenting. And I never so, so much liked the name because it was just good enough. It wasn't this amazing parenting. It's just good enough. It kind of talks with all the life tra traps and deals with the life traps that a lot of us parents have because again, we weren't raised in per perfect households. But trying to stop and not pass on some of the dysfunction in which we were raised in. And if you can identify that, you can stop the chain so that you're not passing that dysfunction on to your children. So I highly recommend the book and it's been really helpful to Aaron and I in, in raising our children. Um, what I will also say I think is that being overly strict as a parent is one extreme, being overly permissive as parents is the other. And as Christians, we want to avoid both extremes. And there are times obviously to be firm, and, and, and there are times also to, of course, always cover, cover, cover our parenting in love, but it can't be that we let our children run ragged, and it can't be that the, the home is so strict that it's stifling. And so there's some happy medium that I think Jesus helps us find the balance. And maybe last but not least, and I haven't even gotten into verse 10 yet, so I'm sorry this is taking longer, but servants and masters, and I think this is one important maybe couple sentences about that. It took far too long, while it took far too long to do so, the gospel, even in the first century, began to undermine the institution of slavery. And that's because of Jesus and because of the word. It lit a fuse which at long last led to the explosion which destroyed it. And we still have in the world today, you know, human trafficking and elements of slavery. But it is, I think, through the scriptures that those who sought to change their flaws and their ways saw the light and saw the truth. And so to paraphrase Galatians 3.28, all of us who are in Christ are the sons and daughters of God, and there is neither slave nor free, for all are one in Christ Jesus. It's the first level setting where a master and a slave, they were equal. And Paul is speaking to both of that, those audiences in the church at the time. And so shattering that wall of, that was extremely radical, as you can imagine, of a master to for the first time think, I'm equal, right? And, and of course it should always have been that way. God has always known that, but it, is, it did shatter those walls. And again, taking too, too long to do so, but that began in the gospel. Okay, sorry for that long uh, one through nine paraphrase. If we go into Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, the scripture reads, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, heavenly realms. You will never hear on the news Satan's schemes were terribly effective today. They led to the blank, blank, blank 
And you can fill that in, right? Because there's some craziness that you see on the news every night and on a daily basis. There are people who worship Satan in this world, of course, but the vast majority of people, including Christians, they're caught in his schemes because they disbelieve in his existence, or they think of him merely as a cartoonish red devil. I don't know if it shows up very well. C.S. Lewis said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race <clears throat> can fall about devils. One is to believe and disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors, and they hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And if you've read the screw tape letters, I think C.S. Lewis does a great job of in an entire book just illustrating from a demon's perspective, trying to illuminate many of those schemes in preparing the Christian to be able to, to fight against our enemy. Paul's appeal is to live a life that is worthy of our calling to Christ and fitting of our status as a people reconciled to God. In this passage, he reminds us of the opposition, the often unseen spiritual battle that is raging. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, the scripture reads, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of the light. His purpose is not to satisfy our curiosity, but instead to warn us of the evil one's hostility and teach us how to overcome that evil. God has brought unity to the different races. He has rescued them from, he's rescued us from death. Satan's plan is to scatter seeds of discord and sin and attempting to destroy that unity and that reconciliation. There will be hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you're following Jesus, you can't avoid it. If we underestimate our spiritual enemy, we will see no need for God's armor and will go into the battle unarmed and without protection, with few weapons except for our own puny strength. You know that word puny, if you've seen you know, Marvel's Avengers, and I know some of the children probably at least have, one of my favorite part in the whole 20 plus movie Avengers series is when Loki confronts these Avengers and he says, I am a god. And mid-sentence, the Hulk grabs him by his feet and he thrashes him back and forth. And the Hulk in his way right, says, puny god. You know, I say that because I think sometimes when we think of Satan, we think that we can do it on our own. We can rely on our own strengths. And like Loki, Loki in this movie, right, we think of ourselves as more than we are. And these forces of evil, they are not human. And if we are not relying on God, but we're trying to come at it through our own strength, it's as easy as the Hulk smashing us back and forth. And I think that's also how many people, unfortunately and sadly, experience life that don't know the scriptures and that don't know Jesus. What does it look like in practice? Well, in 2 Corinthians 2, a little bit more illumination to this evil one. The scripture reads in verse 10, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You know, as Christians, we're not supposed to be unaware of our schemes, and yet still we see Christian brothers and sisters that fall to his schemes. If you cannot forgive those who have wronged you, you assuredly are letting Satan out with you. We cannot belong to Jesus without forgiveness because we are called to forgive as he has forgiven us. And even my children, for example, know this. You know, in a timeout, when they've done something wrong, we do the timeout so that, you know, you get the amount of minutes for the age you are. At the end of the timeout, they need to apologize to their brother or sister, and then their brother or sister has to, well, doesn't have to, but there's a forgiveness that takes place there. And they don't get out of the timeout unless they end up forgiving each other. And there's a reconciliation that happens. I think as adults, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think as adults, we forget the simple lesson that our children know. We're not the first one to apologize. And you can think about it as in your marriage, in your best friend. Sometimes the closer you are, the harder it is to be the first one to apologize because it runs deep. If we can only kind of go back to the scriptures and avoid Satan's screams and, and be even like what we teach our children on the subject of forgiveness, it will nullify and won't allow Satan to get a foothold there. 
in between urging us to seek the Lord's strength, put on the armor of God, and itemize the spiritual weapons available to us, Paul gives us the frightening and, 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 and full description of the enemy. It is not against flesh and blood. And I'm not sure this can be overemphasized, as all too often we think our enemy is someone who's wronged us. I also ta I talked about the marriage context. What about at work? Your boss, your coworker who's trying to get that promotion ahead of you. Think about any enemy, frankly, that you, you think about as flesh and blood. An opposing political party, right? A friend that has that view. If we think these are our enemies, Satan is winning. And it's in the world and it's on your social media stream. And if we get sucked into that kind of stuff, He's already won, and he's laughing in the corner, and he th it's too easy, guys, right? As Christian, that shouldn't, that shouldn't be us. It shouldn't be easy because we should be aware of his schemes. Our battle is, is against the cosmic intelligences, not human, but demonic. That's scary, right? It scares me. I can't do it on my own power. And another cool tie into the scripture in Ephesians, in Acts 19, and you might know it, but the, 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 there's an incident of Jewish exorcists in Ephesus to the same audience that Paul's writing this letter. And they try to dismiss an evil spirit using the name of Jesus without themselves having a relationship with Jesus. And they're overpowered by the demoniac and they flee, end up fleeing in panic, naked and bleeding. <laughs> Now, this took place in the same city, Ephesus, which Paul is writing this letter. And these Eph this Ephesian converts, many of them had made a public bonfire of their magic books. And it was such a direct challenge to the forces of evil that, of course, that wasn't going to go unnoticed to Satan. Let us never be tempted to think of the spiritual battle cannot lead to bloodshed, and much worse, because he's not just out for blood, he's seeking, he's seeking to claim souls. That is really the danger, right? And, you, and we all saw in the, in the news this Uvalde, Texas, right, with 19, this massacre, 19 children killed, two teachers. Super sad. I can't imagine as a parent what it's like to, to lose a child. And it is, it is something that we need to pray for these families about and, 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 and really kind of grieve. Having said that, there are people that die every day in your neighborhood or in our towns, and they don't go on the news for three, four days in a row. And Satan has their souls. And as Christians, I don't think we're putting the spiritual glasses on with the urgency of what it looks like as though there's an armed shooter in the school building that we need to go and try and address. That's not the urgency that comes on the public, you know, that was on the news when it is actually, you know, it is children dying for the adults in the room that are, are, are getting their souls stolen by Satan. And if you can let that sink in, I think as a Christian, right, that we can really put those, those glasses on and see that spiritual realm, realm for what it is, I think it will lead to more urgency in our Christian life. It actually might lead to a paradigm shift of how we walk out of this room, how we, leave our, how we live our lives, and who we are as a church, and who we impact. Children dying is super sad, but the great part, and we know this because we know the truth, is that they'll be in heaven and not in the mealy mouth, you know, you attend a funeral and everyone says he's going to heaven, she's going to heaven. Those children's souls, they really will be in heaven. I, it's the biggest pipeline, I think, by the way, to, to heaven of children on this earth dying. I, I joked with a friend the other day saying, we're going to get to heaven and the average age is going to be in the single digits in heaven because there's so many of children's souls throughout the, the millennium that have died. So while it's sad and while, while people will miss those children, at least they're making it to heaven. Let's contribute to those souls that Satan has a foothold where they need a defense for their sin, where they have owned their sin and we need Jesus to cover us. How about that? When we think about Satan and we think about the evil one and putting that mindset on. And maybe just to close out, sometimes, well, I close out on this, on this first point, on the enemy we face. Three main characteristics of the evil one. One, that he is powerful. And that's the world, world rulers in present darkness. So that the power is there. Power in itself is neutral. So just like wielding a knife, that's not necessarily bad, but when you combine it with being wicked and evilness, 
the wielding that Satan uses that power is truly pretty dangerous. And the third one is cunning, where the, the clever schemes that we as humans consistently underestimate and minimize, the most clever thing that Satan does is convince us that he doesn't exist. So let's not be those complacent ones. Let's, let's put on our oxygen masks so we can put the oxygen masks on others and help rip souls from the world and bring them to their rightful home in heaven. The armor of God. So if I've convinced you now that there really is an evil force and he is not to be reckoned with, with on our own power, we need to figure out what tools we have available to us. In Ephesians 6, 13 through 20, the scripture reads, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, guess what? Stand firm. <laughs> Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as as I should. So question for you, what is the purpose of armor? And I know it's rhetorical, but I would say to protect. And I think that's what Paul has in mind here. Those without armor are frankly easier prey for Satan. It's as simple as that. And why? That we as Christians, because this is a Christian audience, right, that he's writing to, it's not the lost. So this is actually an audience that have these, has these tools already available to him. Why? It's so that we might withstand the evil day. The evil day is when Satan has decided to launch an attack against your marriage, against your finances, against your children, against your loved ones, against your dreams, keep going. Nothing will, prov nothing will prove where we stand spiritually more than what we do on the evil day. It's that day or week or month when hell comes to get you. And I can't emphasize enough, there was an extended family member last week where the evil day came for this extended family member of us. And it had to do with kind of losing life savings, not having raised their hand and talked and communicated. And if you're thinking and sitting in the audience thinking that that evil day doesn't happen to me, I would say that that C number, you know, C number one, go back to the first start, right, and take the enemy seriously, because I think that evil day will come for all of us. And it might not even come where it's personally you, but if it comes to get one of your family members, that by extension can still reflect you in ways that you have no idea. And so we even as a family and my wife kind of going through it last week because of by, by knock on this extended family member having this evil day come through, come for them. And as we're going to talk about, I, I think throughout, it will be revealed how well we are prepared by how we respond to Satan's attacks on that day. In these six pieces of armor, there are, are three that are in place and there are three that we take up as needed. The first one is the truth. And the truth is defined, is, is God's view on any subject. It's what, why we start with it. He is the standard. And there are two answers, I think, to every question. There's God's answers and there's our answers. Sometimes they align. Not always. And when our ways don't align with his ways, God way, God's way is always right. And no matter how long it takes us to get there and agree with him. Only the truth can combat Satan's lies, and only the truth can set us free. But the important part is it's only the truth that we know. If it's true, but we don't know it, we won't be free. 
In John 8, verse 31, the scripture reads, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln in January of, 19, of 1863, and slaves in Texas were not told about it until June 19th of 1865. The information of the signing was not passed on. It was true that the slaves were free, but in Texas, they didn't know about it. One and a half years in bondage because they didn't know the truth. That analogy can be applied to Satan, by the way, who is the father of lives, who is the deceiver, and speaks in partial truths, but will never tell you that you've been freed, will never give you the access, right, to Jesus without you deciding to go and pursue him and put the armor on, put this belt of truth on yourself. And so because he's a liar and because he won't tell us the truth, we better know it or we're going to remain slaves. Does that make sense? All right, so the belt of truth, and I, by the way, it's not an accident that it's a female uh, uh, spiritual warrior here too, by the way, because I think holding up, I think we, brothers and sisters, we, we, we speak about that equality, but we are in this battle equally, and we can learn from our sisters, by the way, in all elements of these six pieces of armor, just as much as we can learn, or learn, learn from brothers. Small side note. S second one, the breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> So with the breastplate of righteousness in place, righteousness in Paul's letter means justification. That is God's grace in putting sinners right with himself through Jesus and the relationships even more broadly so. Once we know the truth, we can make the right decision and we will have to make thousands of decisions in our life, but will we make the right one? It speaks to character. Who are you when no one's looking? That's the bright spread of righteousness. And underneath, it covers up vital organs. So it certainly protects your heart. It's something, again, as we talked about, that he expects, that, that, G, that God expects that we have in place all the time. To be clothed with righteousness is not one's own, but clothed with Christ. To stand before God, not condemned, but accepted, it's an, an essential defense against an accusing conscience and slanderous attacks of the evil one. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Jesus. So let's not let Satan get to our vital organs through this breastplate of righteousness, which we, uh, which we won't allow, which we, by having it on, won't allow him to get to. I'm going to try and go faster, and I'm sorry. I'm only on three, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm over 20 minutes, so I'm trying to, trying to bring it into a landing, and I'm, and I'm sorry. The third one, the feet fitted with readiness. So in the Roman times, as a soldier, feet super important. If you don't take care of your feet, you're gonna be a liability to your army and to those next to you. You, in fact, won't be able to flee and you won't be able to move once you know the truth and you know the right thing to do. So feet are super important. It keeps you from not slipping. It allows you to be fast. It provides us with a firm foundation to fight evil and the ability to know the truth and again, to follow the right decision. So there's this readiness, and also readiness to announce the good news of peace and the good news of the gospel, to help others, right, that don't have these arm, the armor on. We should always be ready to bear witness as God's messengers, to give grace through salty answers to questions which the world puts to us. And such readiness should have a stabling influence on our lives. It allows us to be fishers of men and women. The fourth one is the shield of faith, and these are the things that we need to take up as we need them. It's an indispensable addition, specifically designed to put out dangerous incendiary arrows which were dipped in pitch and, and, and lit on fire and fired. Not just arrows, arrows on fire. <laughs> So fiery arrows aren't necessarily to kill you. The arrow was to do that already. It's to set your house on fire. It's to set a distraction so that we are going to pay attention to all this other stuff. And then we move out from our, we move out from our shield and then the, the arrow hits us. And then the arrow can kill us. So there's a specific reason why these arrows are on fire. Your castle, your house, your car, whatever it is, it's something else that gets on fire so that Satan can get to you. What are some of those accusations which lead to, 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 uh, to those arrows getting through? False guilt, 
Thoughts which lead to doubt and disobedience, lust, malice, fear, the list goes on. The things of missing the mark, because that's an archery term as well, are many. We don't have time to go into all of them. The fifth one, the helmet of salvation, usually made of iron or bronze. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the scripture says the hope of salvation, which is pretty powerful. The knowledge and confident expression of the full salvation on the last day, including the resurrection and glory of Christ in heaven. If we know we are saved, Satan cannot take that away from us. And that's up here. And we can only, we can decide to give that salvation up. He can't touch us. Think of your favorite movie, because you've probably watched it more than once. The first time you watched it, there were lots of surprises at the, at the turns coming. When you watch it the second time, it's still, still just as cool, and maybe you notice different things, but you know how the movie ends. And so you're not as anxious at that bad guy jumping out or at the hero just making it by a skinny thread. And you know that the ending of the movie is going to be redemption and that, that good will triumph over evil. So the question is, how is the hope of salvation transforming your daily life, our daily life? And if it's not, that's okay, but, but, but why not? Why not? The last one is the sword of the spirit. And it's the word of God, of course, and of course, and it's the only piece of the six that can be used for attack as well as defense. Any attack will involve a close personal encounter because this was a short sword if you look at the, the, the original Greek. In Revelation, it's, it's seen issuing from the mouth of Jesus in Revelation 1.16. It includes the words of defense and the testimony of Jesus, the promised Holy Spirit put inside us, brothers and sisters, so that we can defend in front of authorities that were dragging us, that drag us in front of them. Most broadly speaking, of course, it's used to cut through defenses and prick our consciousness and to stab us awake spiritually, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. We use the scriptures to, to resist temptation against Satan. We don't think about that often, but Satan quoted scripture to Satan, and he fled from him. That's a pretty cool offense, right? I don't care about guns and violence, and I don't think Jesus does either, but this weapon, this is a powerful weapon, and we should be taking it up. So, so the question is, and maybe the other kind of wing of that airplane is, we use it, of course, to help people find their way home and to hold to Jesus' teachings. So we use it in both ways. So the question is, how in touch with our swords, how in touch with our Bibles, because they're on these things these days, how in touch are we today? How, how well do we wield it and do we practice at it? Because we can't be a good soldier if we're not in practice. How is your offense? The last one is prayer. And, and Paul adds, not as an afterthought or as an unnamed weapon, but because it pervades everything. It pervades all of our spiritual warfare. It's the last expression of our dependence on God. It's prayer in the spirit so that we are guided by him. And just as God's word is the, spirit, the sword of the spirit, scripture and prayer belong together as two chief weapons put into our hands. So there's custom armor for each of us. And those are all the pieces, the six, and then the prayer again over all of that, if that makes sense. In conclusion, I'm gonna read six, uh, Ephesians 6, 21 through 24, and then I have one last question. So in 21, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending you for this very purpose that you may know who, how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to bro the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God and fa the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. In this last picture, and I don't know if I can put it up here, a photographer was asked to, to, to paint peace in two, two different photographers were asked to take a picture of peace. And this is what the first one came up with and this is what the second one came up with, the A and the B. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the first one, it's this serene dock with a glass uh, lake and you can see the reflection of the mountains and it's super serene and peaceful. The other photographer, takes a picture of a ship in waves that are taller than it. 
and you can may just make out the sun on the horizon just through the lightning and the rain and the storm. And it's super in doubt of whether the ship is going to sink or where it's gonna, whether, whether the ship is going to make it. Peace as a Christian, I would offer to you, is not the calm water, but it's rather when everything is going wrong, when hell is knocking at our door, and yet we still find a way to sing through it. We're st we, we still have all of those weapons of armor on, and we're not phased as we go through that storm. When we face the enemy, because we will, Will we confront the enemy with the armor of God on? Will we be, as Jesus did, unfazed and, and not anxious because of whose we are and because of the armor that we, are, we have on, because we're ready for him? Only with God and only when we've decided to put on the armor uh, that he's provided us can we fully... <laughs> live a life that I think we've been called to as Christians. And I think for some of us, we've, been, we've laid down our armor recently. There might be a part of that armor where it's sitting on the side and we need to blow some dust off of it. And that's okay as long as we do it. There's a decision, obviously, to put on that armor. It's not assuming that we've done so. And I pray even as we just look into this Ephesians 6 and the armor of God, in fighting and combating the enemy that we make decisions today, leaving out of here to put that armor on and to flourish and, and, and take hold of what Jesus has already done for us and what he's given us through the word of God and through the spirit. If we can bow our heads and go to him in prayer. God, thank you so much for the armor that you have provided us. Thank you, Father, for, for Jesus who showed us how to wield it because he lived on this earth and he, could, he confronted the enemy and, and he was victorious in that battle. That we, Father, can be little Jesuses as we walk through the earth uh, and we can help others, Father, to find their oxygen in you. I pray, Father, that we can make some decisions coming up today out of, this, out of this message, that the word can speak in our hearts, and that even when things are said from the pulpit, and as hard as it is to do in practice, that, that people have, we have each other to hold each other accountable, that we have, we have brothers and sisters we can go to with our deepest, darkest stuff to talk about so that we are not isolated so that Satan can come get us. I pray, Father, that... Out of, this, out, of, out of this word and out of this lesson, we will have the armor on and we will be able to be worthy for you in our fight and in our battle. And we love you with all, our, all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.